we're seeing, by my estimate, probably a tenfold increase in attitudes towards political violence now compared to before Donald Trump was president. There's domestic terrorism investigations in all 50 states. One in 10 Americans believe Donald Trump should be forcibly reinstalled in the White House. Uh, and another one in 10 Americans say they do believe violence against the government uh, is justified. It's a really, really alarming environment. And one of the blinking red indicators of why a pressure release valve is needed in our political system. So what I experienced uh, coming out and speaking out against Trump it is, in fact, one of the reasons why I grew much more open to the idea of a new way in our political system and the need for a new party. It is my pleasure and thrill to welcome to Forward the co-CEO of the new Forward Party, New York Times bestselling author, patriot, American, whom I call the bad boy of American politics. You'll see why he earned that moniker, Miles Taylor. Welcome, Miles. Well, for those who are watching on video, I tried to do a Superman fly over the camera, but it, it looked more like me just trying to show my belly button. It so must look like you stretching, but it's all to the good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it's it's been an awesome week or so for us uh, with the announcement of Forward Party. Wow, have we sent shockwaves and tremors throughout the Beltway, throughout, hap more importantly, throughout homes and workplaces and diners around the country. Uh, what's the last week been like for you? Uh, I mean, it's been crazy. I, I think in, in a lot of ways, this really exceeded expectations. In just the first 48 hours, Andrew, we had uh, 40 million Americans that we reached on television and radio alone. I think we pulled in something like 20,000 plus new volunteers inside the organization across all 50 states. Uh, and again, that was just in the first two days. We're now about a week out from our announcement. And I think those numbers are a lot higher. And that was the goal is to let Americans know, basically help us on the way. There's a new option in our political system, and uh, we're seeing folks come out in droves because they're frustrated. And, and that's really what the theme, I think, for the past week has been, is that people are really, really frustrated with the current system. I think I saw a poll the other day that showed 90 percent of Americans are unhappy with the direction the country is going. And that's partly because the existing, outdated, sort of stagnating two-party system is actually just not solving our problems. So no wonder people are pissed off. Um, and that was another headline this morning is that uh, I think it was in the New York Times, they did a focus group with something like seven Republicans and six Democrats. And the theme was uh, there actually was common ground between Democrats and Republicans. And it was that they're pissed off at the status quo. Yes. Um, I think that's very telling. And it's why we need something new. Yeah, we need some positive change uh, to hopefully, uh, frankly, balance some of the negative changes we see uh, occurring around us. So how the heck did you get to this point? Because I think most everyone who's in independent politics uh, has a bit of a story and you have a better story than just about anybody. So when I say that you're the New York Times bestselling author, you were better known as anonymous uh, because you wrote a book from within the Trump administration and getting out of the Trump administration, you faced threats to your personal safety, uh, like great personal costs. Uh, how the heck did you get to this point? You know, look, it, it, no one has to play the violin for me that things got really rough and tumble in the political system. But, but I will take you back in time and talk about how I wound up there, because I don't even think my story makes sense that I'm now working in independent politics. In fact, I never wanted to work in politics. I hated campaigns. I hated the political side. I was a policy guy, not a politics guy. And after 9-11, I went into government because I'd been in the World Trade Center two weeks before the attacks and, and in the weeks after was diagnosed with mild post-traumatic stress disorder. I had taken the news of that day so, so personally and seriously uh, and traumatically that I resolved that what I wanted to do was spend the rest of my career in national security and make sure a day like that never happened. 
that took me on an odyssey through Washington, from Capitol Hill to the Pentagon to the White House. Ultimately, I ended up at the Department of Homeland Security, the department that was created to prevent another 9-11. So I worked there during the Bush administration as a, as a briefer to the secretary, you know, working on a range of intelligence issues. And then after the Bush administration ended, I went uh, back to Capitol Hill and worked in a number of national security roles up and until Donald Trump ran for president in 2015. Now, I was a lifelong Republican, and we saw Trump more as an oddity than anything. But he went from an oddity to a major worry to a calamity in 2016 when he did the unthinkable and he won. And I was working as a, again, as a national security aide in the House Republican leadership at the time, had no interest in going into the Trump administration, but, you know, in the, in fact, had worked pretty extensively to try to keep him from getting elected. In fact, I was the co-author of what Paul Ryan had termed the Trump inoculation plan behind closed doors at the time, which clearly failed miserably. It failed spectacularly because not only did we not inoculate the Republican Party against Trump, he took it over and he won. So I decided I wasn't going to go into the administration. But then uh, a mentor of mine, someone I looked up to, John Kelly, was picked to be Homeland Security Secretary uh, and, and basically said to me, it's not as bad as it looks inside the Trump administration. It's a lot worse. And uh, I was persuaded to come in and be his national security advisor, ultimately became chief of staff at DHS. Uh, and in short, Andrew, you know, what I saw uh, really terrified me. I had hoped at the beginning that Donald Trump would have been someone who the office moderated. A lot of presidents, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, talk about how the Oval Office changed them. Um, I was hopeful that that would happen with Donald Trump, maybe even a little naive, uh, and it didn't. And from day one, it was clear not only that this administration was turbulent, but that it was, a, as one cabinet secretary said behind closed doors, a threat to the fabric of our republic. So, uh, you know, I ultimately I wrote a piece, an essay in The New York Times explaining what the president's own people were saying about how dangerous he was, because I felt like there was a lot of talking heads saying that Donald Trump was reckless, but it, that was one thing. It was another thing for his own senior leaders in his cabinet to be wondering whether they should invoke the 25th Amendment and get rid of him because he was so dangerous. And, and I felt like people needed to know that. So happy to talk about that experience. But ultimately, that led me to, to quit the Trump administration, unmask myself and, and campaign against him so that he wouldn't be reelected. Well, cer certainly, I'd love to hear about your experience. You must have been paranoid and freaked out where you write this essay and then everyone's like, who wrote that? Who wrote that? What the heck is going on? Um, that must have been an extraordinarily stressful, difficult set of experiences. Yeah, you know, I, a couple of things. I mean, I, I want to comment on anonymity because a lot of people rightfully questioned my decision to write that essay anonymously. And part of my inspiration behind that was, and I'm not comparing myself to these people, but was the founding fathers. We saw uh, around the time that the Continental Congress was trying to get the, uh, you know, the Constitution passed in the United States, a group of people who called themselves Publius, and they wrote a series of essays defending the Constitution. That was a number of founding fathers, including Alexander Hamilton and John Jay. The reason they hid their names was not because they were scared to put their names out there, but it's because they knew if they attached their names to those essays defending the Constitution, the critics would make it more about them than about the substance. So they hid their names to make people focus on the message and not the messenger. Now, in the time that I was in the Trump administration, it became very clear to me that Donald Trump was a master of the politics of personal destruction and distraction. Right? He would create a personal fight to distract from his own deficiency. So I decided I submitted this essay to the Times and I said, you know, I want to use a pseudonym. And I actually asked them to use the pseudonym Publius. And the Times said, well, we don't do pseudonyms, so we'll just we'll just put anonymous. But the reason I wanted them to use the Publius pseudonym is for a discerning student of history, I wanted them to see the connection, to understand why I was not exposing my name, but my plan. Come on, New York Times, accept pseudonyms. It'd be That's so right. much cooler. Come on, pseudonyms. You could, like, you, you know, you could write Max Power. You could do Publius. You could do, 
whatever the heck you want. Come on, Times. Let's spice this up. Well, you know, I'll say one thing, Andrew, which is that, you know, I, I expressed publicly, I later wrote a book also anonymously called A Warning to write a longer form explanation of why I didn't think the commander in chief, based on my personal experiences, deserved a second term. And in fact, why I thought he was exceptionally dangerous for this country. But I ultimately pledged that I was going to unmask myself. And I did. And I don't want to I don't want to demean people who blow the whistle and want to maintain anonymity. In fact, there's a very patriotic person who's still anonymous, who uh, blew the whistle on Donald Trump's Ukraine phone call. You know, the perfect phone call he said he made that he was impeached over. I respect that person's decision to maintain anonymity. Uh, but I'll be honest with you. I personally felt like if I did that, uh, and I had an opportunity to go out and campaign against him, and I kept the mask on, that ultimately it would be cowardly. Uh, and, and, you know, people may be surprised to hear Anonymous say anonymity is cowardly. Um, I don't think that's always the case. I thought it would have been in my case if I didn't come forward. And here's why. Because a lot of the things that I had to say about why Donald Trump was unqualified for office could not be said with a mask on. Uh, because I had to be specific. I needed to detail meetings, things he said, things he did. And that required stepping out of the shadows. But to your question, Andrew, um, you know, I had a conversation with someone I was very close to at the time, one of the very few people who knew that I was this, you know, this pseudonym, this, this, this character, Anonymous. And uh, the person close to me said, you know, what's the worst that could happen if you come forward? And I said, well, you know, a MAGA person could come up in the street and you know, pop me and that would be that. And that sounds very dramatic, but honestly, our political environment was getting so tumultuous at that time, and this I think only gotten worse, that expecting a violent reaction almost made the most sense. So the person says back to me, okay, well, what's the second worst thing that could happen? I said, well, you know, I could lose my home, my job, my personal relationships, my friendships, my, you know, family security, my life savings. Um, you know, it could get really ugly. It turned out, at least knock on wood so far, Andrew, to be the second scenario. Now, again, I say that not because I want any sympathy. I don't want sympathy from anyone. I went into this clear eye. But I say it because the environment we're in today is an environment of enormous political intimidation. So someone like me from the national security community was pretty well prepared, as, as prepared as you could possibly be, to be on the receiving end of a vitriolic commander in chief held then on revenge and an army of MAGA people coming forward to come after him. But the poll worker, the community leader, the school board member, the people we've heard from in the January 6th select committee hearings, those people weren't prepared for the consequences of speaking out. And now it's happening to everyday Americans. That's what I worry about. And I'll add some data to this. Uh, and that is, you know, we're seeing by my estimate, probably a tenfold increase and attitudes towards political violence now compared to before Donald Trump was president. There's domestic terrorism investigations in all 50 states, in every single FBI field office in the country. One in 10 Americans believe Donald Trump should be forcibly reinstalled in the White House. Uh, and another one in 10 Americans say they do believe violence against the government uh, is justified. It's a really, really alarming environment. And one of the blinking red indicators of why a pressure release valve is needed in our political system. So what I experienced uh, coming out and speaking out against Trump is in fact one of the reasons why I grew much more open to the idea of a new way in our political system and the need for a new party is because I think a lot of the vitriol we're seeing is driven by the fact that people feel like there are no alternatives in the political system. There's no peaceful way for them to convey their political opinions and folks are being radicalized to violence. It's really alarming from a national security perspective, but just in terms of the health of our democracy uh, is, is incredibly disturbing. I saw it firsthand and it's one of the reasons why after January 6th, rather than go back to the private sector, which I think everyone in my family wished I would do, I decided to stay in the uh, political fight. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Starting a third party is super exciting, but I gotta say, it's sometimes a little bit stressful. 
I do my best to take care of myself, my mental health. I try and exercise. I try to get some outdoor time. But sometimes you need a bit more than that. Sometimes you need out-and-out therapy. I saw a counselor for the first time when I was a teen, and I've been a big believer in therapy ever since. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and live chat-only therapy sessions, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you're not into that. It's more affordable. You can be matched with your own therapist in under 48 hours. Take care of yourself. Invest in your own mental health, which really is the same thing as health. And our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash yang. That's betterhelp.com slash yang. Well, hats off to you for being so courageous. I mean, the, the fact is, uh, most people have no idea what it's like to, to think that their life could be threatened. Uh, it puts me uh, to thinking about the Republican members of Congress who were voting to impeach Trump. And what I was told was that something like 35 of them said, yeah, I'm going to vote to impeach Trump. This is uh, a bridge too far. And then they all started getting messages, including death threats on their phones. And then the 35 went to 30 to 25 to 20. And then by the time the vote actually happened, it was down to 10. And even those 10 had no idea who else was going to vote uh, for impeachment. And by the way, now I believe uh, seven of those 10 are uh, out of office. Uh, One of them, Peter Meyer, just lost his primary. um, And his extremist election denying Republican opponent was boosted by Democrats, which angers me. I mean, how can you say, hey, I'm for democracy on one side, but I'm going to spend hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars boosting someone I, I, I think is uh, trying to completely upend the system. Uh, and, and so I, I think about those members, including Peter, and some of them had to go into hiding for a period of days after because there was so much venom being d- directed toward them. Most people have no idea what it's like to be on the receiving end of that. And the fact that, I mean, you're making light of it. You're like, hey, it's not about me. It's about the fact that our country's in trouble as a system. But really, just want to salute you and your courage because most people wouldn't have been able to do it. Well, I, I appreciate that, Andrew. And, you know, I, I try to tell those stories so people can viscerally live in it. I mean, I, you know, the day that the election was held uh, on, you know, November 3rd, 2020, a, a lot of people were you know, out and about jubilantly hoping the election would result the way they wanted to. I spent most of that night holed up in a safe house in Virginia with an armed bodyguard, right? That wasn't exactly a lot of fun. Now, I did make it out of the house. Uh, you know, I had a driver that, you know, I was I was lucky to have protection. I couldn't afford it. I was very lucky that someone helped me for a period of time get protection because of the death threats. Um, but yeah, you know, that's, that's not where I had imagined myself on election day when Donald Trump was defeated, but that was a a result of the really, really graphic messages, not just I received, but you know, my pregnant sister, my father, my mother, my cousins. I mean, this is an environment where anyone thinks they can uh, have you know, and have the right to reach out and, and punch you or hit you or, or, or threaten you. It's um, it, and we've seen the extrapolation of that into our political system. And I mean, as you know, Andrew, after the January sixth insurrection, members that voted to impeach Donald Trump, I know a number of members of Congress who were going to vote to impeach him, and changed their votes because of intimidation. These aren't made up stories. Liz Cheney went out there and publicly talked about how friends of hers in Congress would have voted to impeach, but said look, I'm worried about my family members' lives. That's not how American democracy works. I I can't even believe we're talking about a a point in American history where our congressmen are voting a certain way because they actually are scared if they vote their conscience, they will be killed. That seems like a hyperbolic thing to say, um, but it's also not just an aberration. It wasn't just a point in time since that day. We have seen assassination plots against U.S. governors, against sitting members of Congress, against a United States senator. Uh, Just the other week, we had a congresswoman who had a crazed man with a loaded gun go stand outside her house 
uh, and, and make threats. This is happening. And again, the light is blinking red from a public safety standpoint. Um, and it's really alarming. It's one of the reasons we have to take action. We haven't seen anything like this in modern history or this level of, of division. Uh, and we've got to do something about it. Uh, but, you know, I worry the trend lines are headed the wrong direction. You mentioned Peter Meyer losing his seat. You know, a, a number of these members of Congress who stood up and did the right thing didn't even have to be taken out by a MAGA extremist. They took themselves out because they knew, they looked at the numbers and knew that with the Trump takeover of the Republican Party, it was not possible for them to go win re-election in the districts that they had won handily in previous cycles. They just they just knew they couldn't possibly do it. So um, I think anyone who looks at the Republican Party today and says that the rational side is winning against the radical side must be huffing something that I've never heard of because the, the rational side, the so-called rebels in the GOP, uh, are losing. They're losing very badly. The The war for the soul of the Republican Party is being won by the Trump MAGA base. And again, it's another symptom of a much deeper rot inside the political system. Yeah, it's, it's one reason why you and I are working together to try and upgrade and revamp the two-party system. Because the fact is, if you have one party go dark, as the Republican Party has, then you can be subject to terrible political incentives and intimidation and authoritarianism pretty quickly. It's a very, very vulnerable, susceptible system. Whereas if you had a more robust multi-party system, it, it, it's much, much harder. So so you are under armed guard for your safety. You leave the administration. Uh, the private sector beckons, but you say, you know what? I'm not done fighting for the country. So then you join uh, Renew America, which uh, is trying to help moderate our politics, but I think in particular was investing uh, to try and keep Trumpism from taking over the Republican Party. Uh, wh what has your experience been like at, at Renew? Uh, and how did you get to a point where you said, you know what, we should join forces with Sam and Ford and form the biggest third party yep. by resources in the country, the best chance in a generation for a challenge to the two party system? Watching Netflix without using ExpressVPN, honestly, it's like going to a casino and only playing slots. Like, I'm a blackjack guy. I'm a craps guy. That's where the big money is, even roulette at times. The big money's elsewhere, and that's what it's like if you're using a streaming app and not using ExpressVPN. So here's the deal. Netflix has different content libraries for every country. They've got thousands of shows, but without a VPN like ExpressVPN, you only get access to a fraction of that based on your location. So what you can do with ExpressVPN to unblock this content is that you can change your online location, control where you want Netflix or other streaming websites to think you're located. So for example, I love The Office. I love falling asleep to an episode of The Office, uh, the US version with Michael Scott, with Steve Carell's Michael Scott. You can't get that on Netflix anymore. However, if I tell Netflix that I'm streaming from Canada, I can get The Office on my Netflix, on my smart TV, or on my computer, no problem. So ExpressVPN over other VPNs, why use them? They're super fast. You can stream in HD with no buffering. It's compatible with all your devices. I love that. I put it on my Roku TV. I put it on my phone, my laptop, whatever it is. And you get 94 different countries, right? It's literally thousands of new shows. You want to watch something foreign, you can do that too. So here's the deal. I want you to be smart. I want you to stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to less than the full amount of their content. So get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash yang. Don't forget to use our link. Thank you, Andrew Yang and team expressvpn.com slash yang. That's expressvpn.com slash yang to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. This actually gets into what we're all about, Andrew, because I, I think that just meeting you and getting to know you is a microcosm of this larger story, because you and I don't agree on a lot of policy issues. And, you know, in any other circumstance, in any other period in time, it wouldn't necessarily make sense for us to form a political coalition. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but my first inclination after January 6th was 
you know, we've got to go try to save the Republican Party. And it sounds incredibly naive a year and a half later. Um, but that was my perspective is we've got to save the Republican Party, hoping that Donald Trump was an aberration. And I get a call the day after January 6th. The true story is I get a phone call from my good friend, Evan McMullen. And Evan had worked with me in the House of Representatives. And in 2016, some people may remember, Evan got so fed up with the fact that no sane Republican was stepping forward to try to stop Trump's candidacy. They'd all kind of just become compliant and complicit in his run, thinking that he wouldn't win and, uh, you know, but it would all be fine in the end. And Evan was worried. Evan was like, no, I, I don't think this guy is inevitably going to lose. I think he's a threat to democracy. And so Evan went and ran as a third party candidate for president. Now, we, you know, Evan didn't win, but the hope was they might be able to try to take Trump out or deny him a couple of states. And uh, I stayed in touch with Evan through the years. He started some pro-democracy efforts. And after January 6th, you know, Evan knew I was thinking about just stepping back now that Trump had been defeated. But the insurrection pointed to something much scarier happening in our political system. And Evan said, look, don't tap out. Come, come be involved in this with me. Let's see if we can swing the pendulum back to the center. So we convened a group of 150 or 200 prominent Republicans, some former governors and senators and congressmen and cabinet secretaries. I mean, really, you know, top Republicans who had stood against Trump, some of whom who didn't, but wanted to see the party go back to normal. And we, we put a question to them and we said, what needs to be done right now? Do we either go try to fix the GOP and swing the pendulum back? Or is it time for a third way? Like, do we need to go actually start a new party? And the group was evenly split. We actually sent out a poll on this giant Zoom call, like the most unwieldy Zoom call you've ever been on of these, you know, a couple hundred people. And it was a 50-50 split. Half the group said, no, it's time to go start a new political party. The GOP can't be saved. Um, and Evan and I erred on the side of caution. We said, look, let's give it a shot. And we launched Renew America Movement with a bunch of these former prominent Republicans to go try to protect the good guys, the rational Republicans against the bad guys, the radical ones who were denying the election, promoting conspiracy theories, promoting political violence. And I think what we saw in that year-long process uh, was it, the, not only was the strategy uh, failing, but that the, the MAGA side was really on the ascent. In a sense, Trump playing kingmaker has made a thousand mini Trumps across this country. And they've far accelerated ahead of the pro-democracy side in, you know, going and running for office and winning elections and advancing forward. And it became clear to us that, you know, Trump maintained a Darth Vader-like chokehold over the Republican Party. And so that takes us to, you know, last fall, I had heard, Andrew, that you were potentially starting a new party effort. And I remember having what people call FOMA. I had fear of missing out because I was starting to think maybe this quest to fix the GOP was doomed to fail. Maybe things were a lot worse than I realized. And, um, and I was excited about that announcement. And you and I, a few months later, ended up at the same meeting together in New York City of a group of folks who, you know, came from across the political spectrum, but all of whom were investing in independent races. And at that point, my friend Evan McMullen had left, gone back to Utah and was running uh, for, you know, U.S. Senate in Utah. And Evan's still running for Senate now. And he was doing it as an independent candidate and not as a Republican. And it offered a really unique opportunity to try to go win back a Senate seat for a pro-democracy person. This Evan McMullen race is the most important Senate race in the country. Let's go, Evan McMullen. Continue. And I'm sure we're going to talk about it in detail. It is the most important race this cycle in the country. Evan's running as an independent against Mike Lee, who helped uh, you know, back the insurrection and in an effort to overturn the 2020 election results. And um, you know, uh, when we all got together in New York and, and had a conversation, these groups like us that were investing in races like Evans and other independents, uh, there was a light bulb moment. I think one of us at the table, Andrew, you know, might have been you, might have been me, uh, might have been someone there at lunch said, why don't we just stop talking about informally working together to promote independent candidacies? Let's go do something bigger. Why don't we actually merge and try to go build a new lane? That 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 was me, but continue. <laughs> 
I stand corrected. <laughs> the only way to restore sanity to the system is to offer me offer people more choice. It's more choice and competition. And I'll say, Andrew, I've said it a million times, but it, it bears repeating that right now, all of us have unlimited choice and competition in almost every aspect of our lives, like ride share, food delivery, clothes. Like we talk about this all the time. I, I can choose from whatever option I want in almost everything. Ironically, the one place that in school I was told uh, was all about choice and competition, our democracy. Ironically, I don't have choice and competition anymore. I've got two outdated choices and uh, increasingly they're getting more and more extreme. Now, you know, folks will jump in and say, but wait, you know, don't do the both sides-ism. They're not both equally bad. I, I will be the first to say that I think my former party, the Republican Party, has gone further off the deep end in representing a danger to democracy. That's why I've gone out this cycle to help pro-democracy Democrats win elections. I never thought as a former Republican, I'd be out there trying to help, you know, moderate Republic or Democrats win elections. But that's why I've done it is because we've got to keep the Trump GOP at bay. But what worries me is what you just noted is that also on the Democratic side, there's some really reckless behavior. There's not only Democrats that I know who work for the president at the highest levels of the White House are saying our party's being overtaken by the fringes, but we're also seeing Democrats invest in yeah. Trumpy Republicans because they think it's their best way to tee up one of their candidates. It's like, hey, let, let's put party over country. Let's play politics and elevate like a Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania, who, by the way, last I checked, is actually polling competitively. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I say this, guys, this is how Trump got elected. I mean, do people not remember in 2016, Democrats thought it was hilarious that our party had this carnival barker go from number 17 in the race to number one. They thought it was hilarious. And not only that, there, were de there was dark Democratic money that went in to push, you know, Donald Trump forward or at least to knock down his competitors because he was viewed as the weakest candidate against Hillary Clinton. Well, we all know how that story ended. That was not an aberration. But we're seeing that same playbook happen across the country. And it's really disturbing to me. It, it's it's a symptom of the two party system, man. It's like, hey, I'm going to do something. It's going to be smart politics. Check it out. I'm going to like kneecap the moderate and then have the more beatable candidate in the yeah. general. And it's like, oh, no, I lost to the more beatable extremist. Like, oh, you know, uh, I mean, you asked for it. You're playing with fire. And the Democrats do it over and over again, in part because the Democratic Party uh Often, I mean, the Utah Democratic Party was an exception where they put country over party and they said, hey, we're going to get out of the way and um, give Evan a chance to win this thing. Uh, but in other contexts, the Democrats will definitely just say, look, um, we're going to play politics. We're going to boost the extremist. We're going to kick a minor party off the ballot if we think it's going to help us. We're going to fight a ranked choice voting initiative if we think it's bad for our interests. Uh, and, and it does frustrate the heck out of me when the Democrats present themselves. It's like, we're championing democracy. It's like, well... You know, democracy doesn't just mean voting for you. <laughs> like, 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 the, like the democracy means people being able to vote how they want. So maybe, you know, a more open system would be good. You said something to me that made me laugh, but I'm, we might as well share it. So I publicly left the Democratic Party, which, by the way, was a much bigger deal than I thought it was going to be. I was just like, well, I guess if I'm going to start this other thing, I should leave the Democratic Party. And then it ended up making all this news and headlines. Um, you left the Republican Party, uh, and uh, I know, and I would not compare our two experiences because you were, you know, uh, had under like threat to your life and a bunch of other things in a way that I was not. So one thing you said to me was was that, hey, you have press requests all the time from MSNBC and CNN as like the former Republican. And you may not know this, but I get press requests every day from Fox and conservative outlets <laughs> where like they, they really like having the person who left uh, the other party on um, uh, so I thought, just thought that you might find that entertaining. Yeah. You know, it, but it's also, I think it's a statement about what's happened. I mean, it, honestly, you and I both had this experience, Andrew, we've been weaponized by one side against the other, right? Cause they think it's such a novelty, these defectors, but to them, we're not a novelty because we represent the majority of Americans who actually want an alternative. It's because they just want to use an ex-Republican or an ex-Democrat to bludgeon the other side. And, and that's, you know, uh, funny at first, but then 
you, you know, you ultimately end up feeling a little bit used by that. And honestly, the thing that most convinced me uh, that we needed a third way in our political system, in all seriousness, was just because I want I want that. <laughs> I want that as a voter. I'm just a I'm just a voter. It's like, you know, you're you're our own customer. I got you, man. And you think there must be millions of people like me. If I, if I want it, there must be others. Yeah. People who build cool products, AirPods, iPhones, whatever. And I'm not trying to hawk Apple, but I'm a big Apple fan. You know, people who go build those products, build them because they want them. They, they need those products. And and the marketplace is not offering that. I desperately wish there was an alternative to the Trumpian Republican Party and the increasingly fringe Democratic Party, but there isn't one. And so, you know, I went through a multi-month period as we were starting conversations with your organization, personally wrestling with this and talking to my fiance and saying, you know, is this, uh, you know, is, is, is this something that we have to go do? Is we have to go build it? Is anyone else building it? And I think the conclusion you and I came to, Andrew, is that this conversation wasn't happening anywhere else in the country. There, there was no special secret room where people were cooking up a plan to save America with a third way, even though Americans desperately wanted it. And the numbers say it. We, we should keep saying them until we're blue in the face. Half of the country is now political independence. This is historic. Half the country, 25% say they're Republicans, 25% say they're Democrats. And even those people who say they're Democrats and Republicans, two thirds of them say they want to see a third party and they would vote for a third party. So let's go do that. Let's go build that. And 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 that's what we're trying to do. Um, but that's what, the other thing that's exciting about this to me is it's also cathartic. We all want sort of the tensions in our political system to cool. And there's nothing like shaking hands with someone that you disagree with and having respect for them. And that's what this whole movement is about. I mean, you know, anytime you and I see each other, the second I see you, one, I smile. And two, I go up and I give you a big hug. It's like these two guys who are totally on opposite ends of the you know political spectrum. One to the right, you know, that's sort of libertarian. That's me. You to the modern, you know, left, you know, center left. Uh, but we we bump into each other and we get excited because it's cathartic to establish not just these friendships but these partnerships across the aisle because we know that we respect each other's policy disagreements and there's a space where we can negotiate and find an outcome that actually works. Whereas, you know, the parties hunkered down in their corners will just fight and fight and fight with their fringe ideas, but not actually deliver. I mean, I lived this in the White House on Capitol Hill and saw the total inability to just get shit done. Um, that's what's fun about this for me is we're building a movement that's all about getting shit done and actually putting forward solutions. You know what's funny, Miles? I remember that meeting uh, at the end of last year, that first meeting, uh, and we started to talk about merging our organizations. There actually, by the way, uh, for you listening to this, there were some other organizations that were in consideration um, that uh, fell by the wayside, maybe revisit, who the heck knows. Um, but I, I was strangely optimistic the entire time that we were going to come together um, despite knowing that this does not happen <laughs> ordinarily, um, mergers are difficult and painful. Everyone has agendas and titles uh, and turf to protect. Uh, we were trying to combine three organizations, much less two. And you know, like as a business person myself, and I had some business people advising me, they would just look at that and being like, a three-way merger just seems like a terrible idea. And I don't really know what you're doing over there. And, and then I would have to say, no, no, this is different because, you know, it's not corporations like, you know, that you're used to. And he was like, oh, OK. They were like, oh, OK, OK. Um, but I, I found myself very optimistic the entire time that we were going to come together. And I will say now our having come together has genuinely made uh, political history where now tens of millions of Americans are asking about the forward party. When did you have that confidence or did you have that, kind of, like, where, where was your confidence interval throughout the process where you were like, hey, like, uh, this is going to happen. This isn't going to happen. When did it actually click for you where like, oh, we're doing this thing? I, I think it was sometime in the spring and realizing that uh, in the early spring, late winter, early spring, as a lot of the races we were seeing across the country that we were invested in at Renew America, the so-called, you know, good guys against the bad guys, the pro-democracy side against the election deniers and conspiracy theorists. 
as those started to break bad and we saw some real radicals get on the ballot, I mean, major QAnon supporters, violent figures, convicted criminals, um, that really cemented it for me that there was no hope in trying to go pull the extremes back to you know, the rational side that we had to go create something new and that there were deeper forces at play. I mean, that really convinced me, um, but also, you know, spending time with this cohort. I mean, incredibly, you know, Ram is a group that was from the center right, the forward uh, original, you know, legacy forward party from the center left and the Serve America movement folks, uh, you know, kind of a, a independent centrist organization. And how well those groups were getting along showed me that this was really possible. And I, and I think we should be unafraid to confront the expected criticisms of a new way. Like, we're not spooked by that. Of course, people are going to say a new party's a spoiler and you can't win. And why have they failed in the past? Um, yeah, we, we welcome those arguments because we think the answers have actually gotten really, really good on that front. Yeah. One, the reason this is different is the, the political environment's completely changed. It's completely changed from when Ross Perot got 19% of the vote running for president. And this isn't about the presidential, right? Our effort is about going and winning down ballot races across the country. The, the 500,000 elected positions around the United States that are largely uncompetitive. The other thing that's changed is not only the massive demand uh, that's much greater than when we saw an independent candidate in 1992 win a ton of the popular vote, um, but is the uh, is how extreme the two parties have gotten. I mean, and I you know we saw data, Andrew, that I think in 2020 on the ballot across the country, something like 70 percent of races in 2020 now it averages that lower uh, didn't have a competitor right? Didn't have more than one person competing for them. That's because the two parties have boxed out competition and choice. So the situation, you know, the situation's gotten more extreme politically. Consumers, voters want more options. Um, and then you add to that, uh, I think, a very toxic political climate coming out of the Trump presidency. And you almost have the perfect storm for a new party to emerge in this country and actually give people a choice. So that's really exciting to me. But to the question of spoiler, you know, you hear that. And I just, I got to go back to the example you gave of Peter Meyer in Michigan. Um, the two-party system is spoiled. It's already spoiled. A system that doesn't give you choices on the ballot is spoiled. In a system where one party is actually boosting extremists because they think it'll help their chances, to me, is really incredibly spoiled. So introducing a new option can only make it better. Well, Miles, it's an intellectually disingenuous question, too, because the fact is, if you're concerned about the spoiler effect, just adopt ranked choice voting and problem solved. But then when you say that to someone, they're not like, oh, thank you. Like, let's go do that. Instead, it's like, you know, they're, they're not there to actually solve a problem. Um, they're there just to uh, say no, no, no. Uh, you know, um, because like that, that's the conditioning and that's the will of the institutions in a country that, by the way, 88 percent of us think is on the wrong track, which is, I think, one of the biggest boosts that, that we're seeing. And the people are speaking. I mean, you talked about the tens of thousands of Americans who are signing up for the forward party. We have some very exciting announcements uh, on the horizon. I talked to uh, your co-CEO, Matt Chinners, earlier today. And he told me that we have volunteer events that had been up and running around the country and that the attendance at those events has now spiked uh, like five to 10 X. Yeah. Um, where I, like fact, the group that, that, that used to be like 12 people is now like 120 people. Um, so knowing that that's happening around the country just makes me so excited because the, the people want this. I mean, it, it, it's, it's ridiculous that it's taken this long in some ways. I got a message from one of our um one of our leadership members inside the organization who is actually upset because they found out that there were so many events being planned in their home state and they hadn't heard about them. And I said, these are happening faster than I can even keep up with. So, you know, the email that got forwarded, that got forwarded, that got forwarded, that landed in my inbox. I said, I had no idea, you know, forward members were organizing this event because it's just happening so quickly. And, and the other thing that we're seeing, Andrew, and I, you know, we'll have some really exciting announcements about this, are people who, like us, never expected that they would become a 
part of a new party movement who served in American politics. I mean, former governors, other presidential candidates from both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, who've been coming to us privately and saying, sign me up, I'm in. And you're going to see some of these people going public very soon. You're going to see some of them out there with us on the building tour in the fall and going into the winter. We're going to be in uh, states all across the country talking about how we're working to get ballot access. Um, but this is the real thing. I mean, this is the thing that a lot of us have been talking about for a very long time. Like, I, I think most listeners who are on this podcast right now have been to a barbecue or a dinner or a conversation with friends or family where you literally said, I just want a group that's like the I'm not crazy coalition. Like, can we just get a sensible political party in this country that gets things done? Can we just have yes. that? Like, we've all had that conversation. And now it's time to just go do it. I'm, I'm so sick of talking about it. I'm so ready to just go build it. And so that's what we're doing. We've got this, you know, merry band of former Republicans and Democrats and independents. <laughs> and yeah. by the way, we're not checking IDs to see if people are affiliated with one political party or the other. Like, that's the thing. You can you can be a Republican and come join the forward effort. You can. You can be a Republican and say, yeah, I'm getting pretty sick of that tribe. I want to go be a part of a new one. You can definitely be a Democrat and just say, hey, just join the forward party. I mean, the, the fact is, you know, yeah, it's the water is great. It's OK. No one's yeah, no one's making you switch. No one's making you change your ID. Just come build it with us. And I also say that more importantly than anyone, Andrew, uh, is to critics. You know, we've seen folks out there who have responded to our announcement in the New York Times or the Washington Post saying, you know, a third party is needed, but I don't know if these folks have it right. I I want those people not not to just debate us, but to come be a part of this, to design it the way they think will work. That's what's really different about this is we are actually inviting critics of how we're doing things to come be involved in our effort. We're not trying to butt heads with them. We actually want their heads to be in good condition so they can come give us the best advice possible on how to build this. That, that's really the funny thing too, Miles. It's like, we're very positive and constructive. We attract positive, constructive people. So if someone looks up and is like, oh, great. Like, uh, you know, I, I want to be a part of that. Then you can come help build it, define it, lead it, you know, come the tour, join us at the convention, uh, like help make this the movement you want it to be. Um, uh, and it's one reason why we're we're succeeding so well is like we're a attracting these can do uh, roll up your sleeves types. And then if you're just someone who wants to be on the side being like, oh, poo poo it like as I got to work, it's like, feel free. Like, you know, I mean, I, I said to someone else, like, watch us work. And then we're just like, build it right in front of you, uh, you know, and and, uh, and we're going to just grow every single day. It's really magical. I can't tell you, and people don't know this necessarily because I don't, but I'm very recognizable in public. People probably realize like, Hey, you know, da da da. every day since our announcement, a dozen plus people have just come up to me and been like, Hey man, forward, love it. Let's go. Let's do it. Like with you, with you, like everywhere I go, people from every walk of life, like at any livelihood, any location, uh, and that to me, cause I've been a candidate before and you kind of sense the energy around you, the energy around forward is sky high. It is so awesome. Uh, and I love, um, uh, I love the positive incoming. I even love the negative incoming because like, you know, that, like that, the thing that we we're, we've done that we've surmounted is that we've already become something to be reckoned with. We become normalized. Uh, and, and that's actually the biggest challenge for a movement like this. The, the fact is like move number one um, is suppression. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, hey, let's just ignore you, uh, which by the, the way, something like Sam has been dealing with for years, uh, you know? And so the fact that we leapt that hurdle just a number of days ago, like now it's off to the races. You know, Andrew, one of the things that I want to say in closing is that this is this is an absolute new beginning for this country politically is forward is more than just a new political party. It really is a movement to try to remake our politics. It's an exciting, optimistic, forward looking movement. And it's not about attacking one side or the other. It really is in our tagline, not left, not right forward. We are all about moving past the extremes, finding common sense solutions and getting things done. That's what's so exciting about this for me. And, you know, I'll say when you look right now 
at uh, you know the things that are happening in this country, I think most Americans can reach, frankly, a majority view on almost every controversial issue. I mean, really, genuinely, from like abortion to climate change, there is a majority view that can be reached to actually move the country forward. But we can see the extremes are actually holding us back. And I would say that this is the most genuine pro-democracy effort I've ever been involved in. I mean, we're not going around the United States looking to invest in races where we're going to take out, you know, unifying moderate leaders from the Democratic or Republican Party. That's not what this is about. This is about going to introduce choice and competition, especially in races where there isn't an alternative, especially in races where you have an extremist on the ballot and no one who can defeat them. That's really where we're going to be investing a lot of our time is going to give people choices in those races where the only choice they have is a really bad one or two really bad ones. So I'm excited about this. The energy is enormous across the country. uh, And I'd love for folks to come join us. So people should go to forwardtogether.org, FWD together, and uh, come be a part of the team. Well, Miles, it's great to be on this team with you, brother. Team America, it is... Uh, we are just getting started on what I know is going to be an incredible journey. Uh, but again, hats off to you for doing so much for the country, for showing character uh, and integrity in the face of a lot of adversity and pressure. Not all of us could have done it. Uh, and we appreciate the heck out of you for, for taking it on. I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, Andrew. Let's go fight the good fight. All right. Thank you. Forward. Let's go forward. And I'm going to fly again.